Today we're going to talk about the intellect and the will. We're going to get really clear on this four-part process, this four-part conversation that they have between each other. And this is going to start to break open some of the thinking that keeps us stuck in our habitual sin. Welcome back to the Catholic Virtues Podcast. If you are new around here, my name is Rita Taylor and I'm going to be your host. Today we're talking about the intellect and the will and I absolutely love this one. I, when I first found out about this four-part process that happens before we make a free choice, my mind was just blown open. A lot of the habitual sins that I was falling into started to get a little bit clearer, like what was keeping me stuck in them. And a lot of it had to do with uh, this process, this four part process. And so sometimes I'd get stuck on one of these four different areas. And I think that this is so helpful. My husband and I just had a discussion about it because he was just trying to help me brainstorm some examples that I could walk you through. And it's just so cool how this all starts to bring a lot of light into how we come to make decisions, how we come to make a free choice, because we know that the will is where we, where we have free will, right? Where we make our free choice. But more often than not, we like, we're not told that there's, that there's actually multiple different decisions, multiple different actions that the will will engage in before it even makes a free choice. And so if we're really struggling to choose something that we know is good, or we're, we keep choosing something that we know isn't good, there might be something going on in this four part process that's actually causing that. That's, that's kind of at the root of that. So let's, let's dive right into it. The first is what we call apprehension. Now you don't actually need to remember these words. I'm just going to give them to you because I want you to have access to them if you need them. But the word is called apprehension and this is what the, it happens in the intellect. And this is where the intellect grasps something as a universal good for the first time. So this is the initial judgment. So just like we did, we talked about the structure in my last video, in my last episode, and we talked about how, you know, it kind of starts in the senses and then like moves all the way up into the imagination. And then the intellect will grab a concept from the imagination and then it will start to do its whole process. It will look at it, will go, is this true or is this a lie? Is this real or is this imaginary? Right? And then it's going to go through this whole judgment process and it's going to start to judge whether or not there is a moral good here. There's going to be a practical good and a moral good. Like it can reason through all kinds of different things. And so once it's come to the end of that reasoning process, at least at the, be- the, first, the first reasoning process that we might call it, it's what we call apprehension. So for example, I'm going to use the example of exercise because I feel like this is one that we can all relate to. We've all probably thought at one point in time in our lives that we should exercise because exercise is good, right? Exercise is good. Exercise will make me more healthy. Exercise will give me more energy, right? Exercise can help me lose weight. There's all kinds of different reasons as to why we judge exercise to be good, but I'm pretty sure that every single one of us at some point has thought to ourselves, hmm, exercise is good. I probably should exercise. And so what that's what we call a universal good. Exercise in and of itself, we, we just kind of think about it as good. We might think of salad as a universal good as well, because most people, when you think about eating vegetables, are just going to think, well, yeah, like that's a good thing to do. Giving to the poor, for example, might be a universal good. It's something that we just kind of automatically think, yeah, of course that's good. But as you can tell, there's this whole process that needs to happen before we go from this is a universally good thing to this is a good thing for me right now. And this is the process that we're going to talk about today is yeah, sure, it's good, but is it good for me? And is it good for me right now? Because we're not gonna choose something unless it's good for me right now. And so once the intellect has apprehended that first universal good, it will present this good to the will, okay? And then the will will begin to observe it and it will make a decision based upon it. And it will make, the first decision that it makes is it has to desire it. So this is what we call to will it. So this is the first, it's not free will, we're not choosing it just yet, but it has chosen to desire it at the very least. So we have a universal good, and then there's a something inside of you that goes, yeah, you know what? I do kind of want to exercise. I want the good that exercise will bring me, right? So you desire it, you will it. Then the will will kind of pop that back over to the intellect with a question. And it will ask, well, is it possible? 
is this thing possible to attain? And so then the intellect has to move into, this is where we start the second process, okay? And this second process is what we call the first judgment. And it's really simple. The intellect just has to look at this thing and think to itself, is it possible? Yes or no? Now, this might seem really, really simple and really, really basic, but I want to spend a little bit of time here because this is somewhere where I see people getting stuck way too often. Because how many times do we tell ourselves it's not possible to do something or it's not possible to attain something? We might look at our house, maybe we've got eight kids, we're tired, and we think to ourselves, it's not possible for me to keep my house clean. We have to examine to ourselves, okay, like, is it actually not possible or is it just very, very difficult? Are there maybe steps that need to be taken? Maybe it's not possible immediately, right? But maybe it is possible if there are certain things that happen in between. So we actually want to take time here and step aside. The same thing we do this with exercise as well. Oh, well, I can't. I can't. Why? Because I don't have time. I can't pray. I'm too tired. I can't go to mass. I'm on holidays. Okay, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of things that we make decisions about because we convince ourselves that it is not possible. Our intellect makes a judgment and says this thing is not possible when in fact it is. And so this is one of the first areas that I want you to stop and, and really think about it. And ask yourselves, how many times do you use the language, I can't? If you use the language, I can't, this is something you need to stop and examine because your intellect is making a judgment. It's making a judgment that this thing is not possible. More often than not, it is possible. It's just uncomfortable or it's very difficult. Okay. It's unpleasant. Those cogitative judgments that I talked about in that last episode, okay? Because it's unpleasant, because it's inconvenient or difficult, or because it feels like it's going to harm us in some capacity. And we sometimes exaggerate the reality of, of how unpleasant, how difficult, or how much harm we're going to experience. And our intellect will actually make a judgment that this thing is not possible when the reality is, is I don't want to. I don't want to put in that effort. I don't want to experience that discomfort or that unpleasantness, or I don't want to be harmed. And therefore I will convince myself that it is not possible because then I don't have to choose it. Because if it's not even a choice, right, then the will is free. There's, a, there's this freedom there because, well, it's not even an option. So it's not even something that I can choose. So this is one of the first places that I really see a lot of good people getting stuck because as a rule, now we can get stuck in that apprehension piece. We can judge, right? We can judge good things to be evil when they're actually good. And we can judge evil things to be good when they're actually evil. We can do that. But I do find that as a rule, like faithful practicing Catholics, they have at the very least a pretty good foundation when it comes to apprehension, the ability to judge whether or not something is truly good or truly evil, because we use, this is one of the big reasons, right? Our intellects are fallen. Our intellects are not actually very good at doing this, but we have the church. Oh, praise God for the church, because that's where we can kind of go and examine our apprehension as to whether or not something is a universal good or a universal evil. And, and we can kind of bounce off of that in order to help us with our judgments. But usually, so usually as a rule, people are pretty good at judging whether or not something is actually good universally or actually evil universally. But this whole possible thing, is it possible? We can get stuck there a lot. So that's the first thing we want to look at is, am I telling myself that something is impossible when in fact it is possible, but I'm choosing not to. Now, I want to be very clear here as well, because this is not, my goal here is not to shame, but I know that this might be triggering some shame and some kind of like judgment and disapproval interiorly because you're like, oh, because you, you might be feeling overwhelmed by all of the things that you know you should be doing, but aren't doing and technically would be possible. But it, but when you look at all of them, they feel impossible altogether. Okay. And there's a reality to this. I want to be very clear. You are not meant to be able to just pick yourself up out of nothing and do it all. <laughs> that's not, that's not actually possible. Not right away. It is possible to eventually get ourselves there, 
but it's not necessarily always possible to do all the things. And this is where it is really important for us to learn how to prioritize what is most important. And we want to do this with a moral and spiritual lens. We want to do this according to our state in life. It's going to have a lot to do with your vocation. Okay. If you're married, if you're staying at home and the duties and obligations that come within that vocation. Okay. So if you're a student, maybe you're still a like a teenager and you're living at home with your parents, a lot of your obligations are going to have to do with your homework, making sure that you're doing excellent there. Maybe it's going to have to do with your participation in your chores at home with your parents, honoring them in that capacity. It's also going to have to do with discerning your vocation. And as you get older, right, that vocation piece starts to move a little bit higher maybe than than being completely submissive to your parents and having to maybe move away, go to university, all these things, right? So there's this whole process and progress and obviously it's not black and white. There's a lot of discernment that needs to be done. This is why the virtue of prudence is so helpful. But understanding that we do need to constantly be using our discernment in these things because we can feel very overwhelmed very often by all of the duties of our life, especially if we don't have the skills to accomplish them with excellence. And so then we have to ask ourselves, what am I focusing on? Okay, sometimes, you know, sometimes as a mom of eight kids, the priority is not a clean house right away because there's other things that you need to develop within yourself, that you need to develop within your family that are maybe more important, that are a priority for you, maybe something that you've discerned is of higher importance than a clean house and you don't have the capacity at this point to teach your children how to clean properly, to clean your house yourself. You don't maybe have the, the income to hire help to come in and clean. We have to, there is a reality that we do need to assess our capacity and make decisions based off of that. But we should never, this is kind of, I guess, the main point here. We should never tell ourselves that it is not possible in that sense, what we should say is, yeah, you know what? It is possible, but I'm not quite there yet. And, and be honest with ourselves about these things. And the reason being is that if we tell ourselves that something isn't possible, if our intellect makes a judgment that something is just not possible, kind of never, we never move towards it. We never make the effort. We never put in the work that is necessary in order to actually attain that capacity to, 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 to level ourselves up in a sense, because a lot of our life's duties are going to require us to develop skills. And the beautiful thing about that is as we work at developing skills, we develop virtues, we develop our moral lives. And so it's a really, they're really intertwined with each other, but really making sure that we are never like, we are not judging something as impossible when it is in fact possible. And it's a different, it's a totally different thing entirely to say, yes, it is possible for me to do all these things, just not yet. But right now I'm focusing on this. I'm developing this skill. I'm developing this virtue. And once this becomes easy and more manageable, then I will tack on something else. Completely different, completely different thing than saying, oh, I just can't. Okay, so catch yourself. Make sure you are not using the words I can't because those words are a trap. <laughs> they're really, really, they're really not great vocabulary because what ends up happening is your brain and your intellect basically shuts down and we stop thinking about ways in which we can achieve these things. When we think that something is impossible, then we don't progress to the next step. Okay, and basically what happens is when we do think that something is possible, then the will, what, what will happen is it will set its intention upon something. Now that again, it's, it's just like a, an increase of desire now, right? So I can think to myself, oh, I'd love to be an astronaut, right? I've judged this thing to be a universal good and I have a desire there for it in the sense that like, yeah, like it, it inspires with me, within me this like, oh, like that would be so cool. There's a desire there. But I have not set an intention upon it. I've not thought to myself, I'm going to be an astronaut. <laughs> like, no, not at all. I'm not, I'm not moving towards that goal in any capacity because it's just ultimately not something that I've really wanted. 
yeah, it's like, it's possible, but in my head, I just like thought it's not worth it. So I, I haven't moved forward on it. And so setting an intention on something, it's, it's kind of taking it just that step further of like, yes, I do in fact want this. It's possible and I still want it. And so I'm going to start to move forward on this. Now, of course, there's another question that the will then needs to ask the intellect. Okay. So in this, now we're going to go into step three and that that question that the will asks the intellect is how, what are my options? Now you can see why I was focusing a lot on it's not possible or it is possible because if we just automatically say that something is not possible, we never get to this question of what are my options? How can I get there? This is so critical because when we too quickly dismiss something as impossible, we can miss out on some really creative opportunities for problem solving. And so if you're, if you find that you're not a problem solver, you might actually be getting stuck here. Okay. You might, you might be getting stuck at just dismissing something as not possible. And if, and so you've never really engaged in problem solving and in creativity and in looking at what, what, what your options are. And a lot of the times we are developed in this way. Okay. So if your parents are just not the types of parents who really engaged you in this way, it could be that this part of your intellect is underdeveloped and that you're going to have to put some effort into that and learning how to do that. And you can ask people, okay, because this is what that third piece is, is called counsel. Okay. So the intellect apprehends a universal good. It judges the first judgment, whether or not something is possible. And then the third process it in- enters into or engages in is called counsel. Now it counsels its own knowledge base for sure, but you can counsel other people, right? You can go and ask other people what they think. Do they have any ideas? How would they do it? How would they go about doing that? Do they have any recommendations? Like, you know, I I know that for example, I've had some of my younger in-laws who maybe were going into university because knowing that I've done a master's program and I'm fairly familiar with the whole university thing and like choosing courses and choosing universities and figuring out how you're going to like go about doing that financially. And what are your options? They came and they asked me like, how did you do it? Like, what are some of the options that, that you've kind of like leaned into or that you've, that you've discovered through your own process of doing this? Like, what are some of the things you've learned? What are some of the things you maybe wouldn't do again? Counsel, right? Really seeking out and looking to other people and asking them these questions. And really what the intellect is doing at this point is it's looking at all of the possible options of how we could possibly get to this, to this goal or unite ourselves to this thing that the will has set its intention on. Now I have had this actually speaking of university, I had a really interesting experience like this before, because when I was looking at my master's program in psychology, it looked like I was going to have to move to Virginia in the United States in order to do that. And at first that felt really impossible to me because like, I just, I didn't know how to get myself to the States, how to apply for a student visa. Was I even going to get one? I didn't know how I was going to go about fi- about it financially. I didn't know how I was going to pay for it because I wasn't able to get a student loan from the government because it was a U.S. course. And I had all of these stumbling blocks and there were so many times where I could have so easily just said, oh, it's like, that's just not an option for me. That's just not possible. But I was working with a spiritual director who just like did not take that. (laughs) He did not have like the possible, impossible was just like not a word in his vocabulary. And he basically just looked at me and he said, Rita, he's like, if this is the Lord's will, there's a way. Ooh, and praise God for that mindset and that attitude. And I have carried that with me ever since. I swear it, just that mindset, that attitude of just like, if it's God's will, there's a way has totally changed my life. And what ended up happening was they ended up having an online course and uh, I ended up getting married. There was actually, there was a lot of different re- really random things that seemed totally impossible. Three things on my heart, three huge desires on my heart that seem completely opposite and conflicting of each other. And all three of them were fulfilled in the most cool and random way, because when it's God's will, there's a way God knows so much about what is possible that we don't. And so it's really important for us to keep that door open and to seek counsel, to talk to other people and, and see 
what kind of ideas we can get from them. And once that counsel, that act of counsel is done in the intellect, the intellect will go back to the will and say, look at all your options. Look at all of these beautiful ways in which you could go about this. And the will will kind of like pick through the options to the ones that it likes the most. So again, here we are, that desire is moving, it's increasing. We went from like just this like random kind of like, yeah, that'd be nice to not only that would be nice, but that would be nice. I really want that to, oh, I really, I really want that. And I like these options as far as getting myself there. And then this is the last question that the will will ask the, inter the intellect. And here we're moving into that fourth process. So the, the question that the will will ask is, which is best? And this is another area where I see people getting stuck. <laughs> how many people, how many times have you felt stuck in discernment? Okay, because you just didn't know which option was the best option. Ah, like, well, I don't know what the Lord's will is. And so I don't know what the best option is. And so then you kind of get frozen in this discernment process. Okay. And you can't make an actual choice. You can't make a decision and you don't move forward. This is the part where you're getting stuck. So the will is asking the intellect, what's the best? What's the best option for me? And this is very specific. It's not just the best option universally, but the best option for me right now at this point. And the intellect has to make what we call the second judgment. And this is the final judgment. Now, there are two virtues in particular I actually want to talk about here because there are two virtues that are incredibly important for us in this process. Okay. And one of them is what we call circumspection, the virtue of circumspection. So it's a virtue that makes up. So all of our cardinal virtues, okay, they are made up of parts, of different parts. And so we need all of these like 10 or 12 different virtues in order to have the complete virtue of prudence. And so circumspection is one of those parts of prudence. And it's the ability to be constantly aware of our circumstances. Now that's just not like the physical environment we are in, although that is one of the things, but our financial circumstances, our vocational circumstances, our health circumstances, right? To be able to consider all of the current circumstances we find ourselves in, that's gonna be a really big part of discerning which is the best option for me. So for example, when I was going to university, <laughs> I, to me, an online option was the best option because I didn't want to have to move down to the States because something really difficult uh, was about to beset my family and because I wanted to get married. <laughs> I met somebody that I wanted to marry and he was in Saskatchewan, Canada and Virginia is really far from Saskatchewan, Canada and I didn't really love the option of doing an online or like long distance dating option. So I really wanted to stay physically present in Saskatchewan. And so an online option for the degree that came up that I didn't know was coming up, right, when I was thinking about taking my master's program, that was, that was huge for me. That, that really opened the door for me in possibilities. And so that was one of the options, one of the circumstances that I was currently finding myself in that I chose, that helped me to choose which was the best option for me. Now, the second virtue I want to talk about here is the virtue of foresight, which is also a part of prudence. And foresight is the ability to kind of foresee future consequences based off of what's happened in the past. And this is particularly important because, you know, let's say you have already taken an online course and it didn't go well because it was all self-study. You weren't able to ask your your uh, your teacher some questions. There were no discussions really happening like naturally with your classmates. And so your grades were quite poor. You found it really difficult to motivate yourself. Now, if you went and chose to do another online course, that's kind of a lack of foresight. It's like, oh, wait a minute. No, you gotta look back and go, wait a minute, that didn't work for me. Maybe you're trying to find a different exercise routine, right? Maybe you're trying to make a decision. Maybe you've, you've kind of went, okay, yeah, exercise is good. I want that. And you thought to yourself, it is possible for me to find some way of exercising, right? And you kind of looked at all of the different options and you've landed on three. Maybe you're going to join a group, like an online group and do some at-home exercises. Maybe you're actually just going to go and do an exercise at the gym by yourself 
or maybe you're gonna do a group class exercise at the gym. These are your three options. You're kind of like, oh, like I like all three of these. Hmm, which one's best for me? But you already know that exercising by yourself with no accountability, it's not, it's not good. You've tried this before. You've gotten a gym membership before and it didn't work out, okay. So then using foresight, you're gonna go, you know what, maybe I need that accountability. Maybe I'll do better if I'm doing a group thing. And so instead that, also, that will narrow down automatically to two different options there. And then maybe you think to yourself, okay, well, what, what are some of the other circumstances that I have? Okay, well, you know what? I maybe don't have any kids, okay? And I have lots of time. And so driving to the gym, that's actually pretty easy for me to do. And you know yourself, you know that you're pretty social and it's, it's easy for you to like get energy from other people. And so you know that when you're in a room with people and they have energy, you're gonna have energy. And so you're like, yeah, you know what? I'm way more likely not only to actually to do the exercise and to do it well, but I'm way more likely to have fun and to enjoy doing it. And if I enjoy doing it, I'm more likely to do it again. So that, so then just judging by your circumstances and using foresight, looking back at yourself, looking back at who, like how you know that you tend to be, what you struggle with, what your weaknesses are, what your strengths are, you're able to then narrow down these options and go, yeah, this is the best one for me. And so a lot of us can struggle with foresight and circumspection because we haven't developed these virtues yet, but they are virtues, okay, please. These are not things that you either have or don't have. These are things we develop within ourselves. Every single one of us are capable of doing this because this function is in the soul. It is not in the body, okay? It is not your brain. Your brain is used. Your brain is a tool that your intellect can use. And yes, absolutely, it is true that there are possibilities, you know, maybe if you're struggling with like ADHD or, um, or some other kind of neurological disorder or that kind of stuff, okay, that this is gonna be a little bit harder, okay, because the brain is not properly um, kind of like suited to that function, but that doesn't mean it's impossible, okay, and God, this is one of the things I really, really want to emphasize, (laughs) okay, God is not as focused on the results as much as he's focused on what you do with what you've got, right? When we think of like the the parable of the talents, right, where he gives one to one, he gives five to another and then 10 to the last or something like that, right? He's not looking at the person who had only one and going, hey, why didn't you bring me 20 like the person I gave 10? No, absolutely not. But could you, could you take that one and can you make it two? Can you progress? Can you increase? That's what God's interested in, right? So we really need to stop kind of comparing ourselves to like what other people are capable of and just kind of go, what am I currently capable of and how can I improve? What am I currently capable of and how can I grow? Can I, can I increase this virtue within myself? That's what God's interested in, okay? That's all you need to focus on. That's all you need to worry about, okay? Because I know that it can get really easy to discourage ourselves. And what's happening is, again, that intellect is telling us it's not possible. Oh, you can't do that. And the world does that a lot. That's one of the problems I have with the world of psychology. A lot of the times is they look at the neurological, kind of like the way that we are neurologically, and they just say, oh, well, you can't do that because you're neurologically not wired this way. It's like, but they forget that the, the soul is the boss and that the soul can, in fact, influence the neurological wiring in our brains. The, our soul can, is stronger, is capable of changing the, the, the neurochemicals that we have in our brain and the neurological wirings we have in our brain. And so it is, in fact, possible for our soul to progress our brain to some capacity. The only time that that becomes actually very difficult or close to impossible if is if there is permanent damage in the brain. That's it. That's the only time. And that is in particular where, yes, you are probably going to need to be on medication for the rest of your life in order to support these functions. And that's okay. There's nothing immoral about taking medication. But we need to understand that unless there's permanent damage in the brain, there is a lot that is possible for us no matter what it is we're struggling with. And just really focusing on that parable and just being like, Do not take that talent and bury it. Do not do that, okay? That is, we do not want that. What we want is to take that talent and we want to go and we want to progress it. We want to grow it. We want to get 
better. We want to increase in these virtues. And so really understanding that a lot of the times, one of the things that we get stuck in the most is we underestimate what we're capable of. And in particular, we underestimate what God is capable of. A lot of the times, our biggest problem here is we don't bring God into the process. We don't bring God's strength. We don't bring God's goodness. We don't, we don't think about all the things that he can do for us, right? Despair in particular as an emotion. And we'll talk about this in our next episodes. We're going to dive into the emotions, but it's really important for us to understand that we despair not just when we don't think we're capable of something, but when we don't think anyone else is either capable or willing to do something for us. So the minute that we judge something as impossible, we are also judging, okay? And this is one of the re- one of the reasons it's actually really not good for us to do this. When we judge something as impossible, we also judge that God is either not capable or not willing to do this for us and to help us with this. And so really taking a look at that, now I'm going to walk you through a couple examples because I've given you a lot of intellectual and I, you're probably starting to grasp it a little bit. But if we walk through a couple of examples, you might be able to start to reflect on maybe how this is happening in your own life. Let's actually start with prayer <laughs> because I think that's the most important one for us to take a look at and really, really, really focus on this because a lot of the times I hear people say that they can't pray or they can't meditate Um, It's not possible for them. They don't have time. You know, it's too distracting in their house because there's kids and all these kinds of things. It's like, no, prayer is always possible. Prayer is always possible. And so we need to actually just take a look and go, why are we thinking that this is impossible? What are the roadblocks? And, And really list them out. I love doing this. This is such a good exercise. It's, and it's an intellectual exercise, but it's also a moral exercise. Whatever it is, that you're struggling to do, whatever it is you know that you should be doing because it's a duty, it's a, it's a moral obligation, um, whether vocationally, right, um, depending on your marriage or, or whatever else, maybe it's mathematics and you think to yourself, I can't do math, whatever it is that you're telling yourself you can't do, that you know you should be doing. Let's take a look at this. Take a paper, take a paper, grab a pen, okay, and think to yourself, why? Why can't I? What's the problem? What's a roadblock? What's keeping me from doing this thing? Time is an often one that we talk about. Money is often one that we talk about. Oh, I don't have enough resources to do this. Okay, time is technically a resource. Yes. Okay, resources to do this. Is it a skill set? Are you, is it that you don't know how to do it? Okay, because that's huge. Oh man, the amount of times I feel like something is impossible because I just don't know how. Changing my tire, changing the oil in my car. Is it actually impossible for me to change the oil in my car? No, no, it's not, but I don't know how. So yeah, it's a lot more difficult to change the oil in my car because I would have to learn how. So not only would I have to just just change the oil in my car, I would have to learn all kinds of things. Okay, so it's not impossible, okay, but it is difficult because it's a skill. It's a skill that I don't have yet. This is oftentimes when people say that they can't meditate and when the people say like they can't keep their house clean, a lot of it is just they don't know how. They haven't been given a system. They haven't been taught how to think critically or how to clean throughout the day. Like my parents taught me how to clean while I was cooking. And I'm so grateful for that skill because at the end of a meal, when I'm done preparing a meal, my kitchen's actually pretty decently clean. It doesn't feel overwhelming because there's, there's like, you know, when I'm waiting for something to heat up or to boil, I'll just wash a couple of pots and I don't care if I don't do all of the dishes. I think to myself, whatever pot I clean is a pot I don't have to clean later. Fantastic. (laughs) Right? So I have this totally different mindset when it comes to cooking and cleaning at the same time. And I have a different approach to it, but that's something I learned. It's not something I just was born into. It's not something that was natural to me. So understanding whether or not there's a skill that we're maybe missing or a mind like, and I don't love using the word mindset. I do use it a lot, but just like an attitude, a way of thinking that maybe we're missing that can be really, really helpful. Okay. When it comes to the time one, that's the one we talk about. Oh, I hear that one so often. I just don't have time. It's like, no, you have time. I mean, one of the, one of the key things I think anybody should really do when they say they don't have time to do something is actually look at the screen time on your phone. Like keep track of how much time you're spending on different apps. 
This is very important. Um, and the other thing is, is every single person in the world has the same amount of time. There's nobody in the world that has more than 24 hours in a day. And so we need to be understanding that it's not that we don't have time, is we're not choosing to put our time there. We are choosing to put our time somewhere else. And it's amazing what will happen when you just tell yourself that. Because, like I said, our brains stop problem solving and our wills just kind of basically completely disengage once the intellect tells us that something is not possible. And so when we tell ourselves, no, it is possible, I'm just not choosing it, it actually switches everything completely because now the will is re-engaged. Because now the intellect's done its job, it says, yeah, it is possible. It's the will now that has to actually decide what it wants. And that can change everything. Just telling ourselves that something is possible can literally change everything because if, if it's something that's good, that the will desires, and the will is told that it is possible, then the will might push it and it might push it further. Whereas before the will was just completely disengaged because it thought it wasn't possible. This is crazy. It's actually like wild when you start to break down all of these little functions and that happen between the intellect and the will, this little conversation, this little back and forth that happens, we can start to really get down to the nitty gritties of where it is we're falling off and where it is we're struggling, where it, where it is we're getting stuck. Okay, so when it comes to prayer, think to yourself, what is keeping me from praying? What are my roadblocks? What are my obstacles? Maybe when it comes to cleaning my house, making my bed, doing my homework, what is keeping me? What are the roadblocks? What's, what's actually preventing me? Because then what's happening is you're telling your will, it is possible, okay, but these are our obstacles. Then the will's gonna go, okay, well, how do we get around these obstacles? The will's gonna start sending these questions back to your intellect and you can start problem solving. Maybe you're getting stuck in the problem solving area. Maybe you know that prayer is possible, but you're struggling because you know all these roadblocks, but you don't have a way through these roadblocks. Okay, well then maybe you need counsel. Okay, that's where you need to ask your, actually tell yourself, maybe I need to go and talk to other moms or other parents or other students, other people who have these same roadblocks and ask them how they've overcome them. How have you done it? And then as you're gathering this information, you might come up with ideas and solutions for yourself. Brilliant, this is beautiful. This is one of the reasons God puts us in community. We don't have to do all the problem, problem solving for ourselves, okay, God? Like there's other brilliant, wonderful people who have gone before us that can help us with these things. And so lean into this, lean into their community, to your community, lean into people who have done this before. Talk to the moms who, who all their children are gone now. Like my mother-in-law, oh, she's amazing because she was so devoted to her daily prayer. She went to daily mass with eight kids. She did it. She found a way, right? So then like really asking, asking these people who have been there, who have done it, who have been through the roller coaster of it and who have found ways through, they can really help you and they can really encourage you to, to helping you achieve these goals. If there is somebody that you know who's really good at cleaning, like their house is just always clean and you're just like, how do you do it? Ask them. What are, like, are there special systems that you use? You know, like, how do you keep your kitchen clean? Like, what do you think of? Like, how do you think about cleaning? Like, what's your, what are your attitudes towards cleaning? Because maybe I can, like, take some of these attitudes in because they'll unlock some of my potential. Really leaning into people who are really good at that. Maybe it's exercise. Maybe you know, there's somebody that you know in your life who's just, like, a really good at exercising. Ask them about how they think about exercise. Ask them what are the roadblocks they've come across and how they've managed to overcome some of these roadblocks. Lean into people in that council. They are so incredible. There's so many people out there who have struggled like you're struggling and who, can, who have gone through it, who've gone to the other side and who can help guide you there so that you're not having to fumble around like for years and years and years. I mean, I know that I'm I've been having a conversation recently with somebody who's struggling with a lot of the same health issues that I've had. And it took me like 15 years <laughs> to figure out what the heck was going on with me. The do like, cause I was, I was really struggling with a lot of the doctors. They were kind of kept telling me to go home and take Advil, even though I was almost bedridden. And I was just like, Advil's not gonna do it. Something's really wrong with me. And I had to do so much research on my own because 
I wasn't able to find anybody who was able to help me. But I found, I learned a lot in that 15 year process and I tried a lot of different things. And so, yeah, there's another young woman who's struggling with a lot of the same health issues as me and she's coming to me and she's asking me questions and I'm like, yeah, like of course I'm more than happy to help you because I don't want it to take 15 years for you. If I can help even take five years off of that journey for you, fantastic. It's such a gift to be able to share your counsel, to share your wisdom with other people. So as a rule, people are very open, very willing, very desiring to help others overcome some of the same roadblocks that they've overcome. So really leaning into that counsel and and just kind of like discovering what are some potential options for you. And then, but if you're that person who really gets stuck in that discernment process where you're like, yeah, like I've come up with a lot of different options. I just don't know which one's best. Again, why not seek counsel in that area? Counsel is a virtue. Did you know that? That asking people for help, asking people for counsel is in fact a virtue. <laughs> That's so cool to me. It's such a beautiful thing because it's a, it's humility. It it's actually increases your vir- virtue of docility as well. Okay, so your ability to to help allow other people to, to influence you. Of course, you need to be prudent in who it is you ask, of course. You know, it's not just like virtue is is not just, oh, okay, so I can ask anybody and and therefore I am now a virtuous person. No, like a part of the the virtue of counsel is part of prudence, okay? And part of counsel is being prudent in who you ask. Asking people who have already achieved what it is you're looking for. Asking people who are very wise, very discerning. Some people are very gifted in this area. And just be like, okay, but also somebody that you can trust because oftentimes when we're when we're thinking to ourselves, what is best for me? And a truly prudent counsel, person who's giving you counsel, who's truly, truly prudent, oftentimes, especially when it comes to a vocational discernment, will never tell you what is best for you because they, they know that they can't know your vocational call. Um, but when it comes to other things, you know, like what type of exercise program is best for you, okay? Asking a personal trainer, booking a session with them and being like, hey, look, these are, these are my health issues. These are my weaknesses. This is, these are the exercises I really struggle. I really struggle with that motivation piece. I really struggle with this. Um, uh, this is, these are the dietary restrictions that I have. Uh, I live in community and so I don't have full, full control over my food. Um, this is the, this is the financial circumstances that I'm finding myself in. Okay. So like, what is the best nutritional plan for me considering these things that's seeking counsel and they can really help you with that that final piece of like which one is best for me and making that judgment for yourself. And so really, I think that one of the biggest problems that we have in our world today is we don't talk enough. <laughs> we don't we don't seek enough counsel. We don't talk to people about our current circumstances. We aren't even necessarily aware of our current circumstances. And that's where even somebody somebody else might be really good at asking us questions and helping us think about these things. They might be able to help us with our foresight, help us to develop that virtue of foresight where they can go, well, what have you done in the past? What's been, what's been a struggle for you in the past? And how can we potentially use that information in order to make a better decision for you in the future? Really engaging in these things. So I'm just gonna quickly go over this four part process again, cause it's, a, it's just, again, it's simple, but it's really neat, but it's also a lot. Because as much as it's a four part process, there's actually eight different things we need to remember. So it's grasping the universal good. Yes, this thing is just a good thing to do. And then we have to desire that good. That's the will. Then we go back into the intellect. We have to decide whether or not it's possible. Okay, and if it is possible, then the will has to desire to decide whether or not it wants to move forward on it, set its intention on it. Once it's set its intention on it, then the question becomes, How do I get there? What are my options? Okay, so that's where the intellect starts to move into counsel, where it just starts to gather all kinds of information and look at all of the different options that it has in order to move forward on that intention. And then it offers all of these things over to the will and the will consents to a small portion of these options. And it goes, yeah, you know what? I really like these four or five different options, these two options. Which one is best? This is the final question. Which one is best? Then the intellect is tasked with that final judgment of which one is best. And it will present that final option to the will. And this is where we make free choice. And the will, even at this point, can choose not to move forward on it. 
right? It can come down to that option of like, this is my best option. And it can at that point go, no, no, I don't want it. And it can reject and move and move on to something completely different. But that's where free choice happens. So there's all this stuff that happens before we make a free will choice. So whenever we get frustrated with people because they, we, we see them making choices that are unhealthy for them or destructive for them, let's just take a breath and let's remember that this is actually a complicated process and that there are all kinds of virtues and, and our intellect really, how, how keen our intellect needs to be, how well developed our intellect needs to be in order to make really good, healthy decisions for ourselves. And how many of us truly have been raised in a way where our intellects are well developed? Very rarely, okay? And so it is really important for us to be patient with people who are struggling to make good decisions for themselves, to be patient with ourselves when we struggle to make these good decisions for ourselves and to kind of look and go, okay, well, what, what area of, of this process needs to be strengthened? Like which area am I weak in? And how can I, how can I improve that? How can I grow in that? Who are some people in my life that I might be able to tap into? Some people that care about me, that are wise, that are prudent, Okay, that can help me with this whole process and developing this, these, these area, this area within my intellect and developing ultimately the virtue of prudence. So I hope that this was helpful. I love thinking through this. I love picking apart <laughs> some of my decisions and going, oh, this is where I'm getting stuck because I find that it can just really open the door for me in so many ways. I've actually just had something like that recently happen to me in the past like month. You know, I had a really bad burnout about eight years ago, seven years ago, and I really wasn't capable of doing a whole lot at that point because physically I was totally kaputzed. <laughs> and I really had to take a step back in my volunteer work. I had to let go of a lot of different things because I wasn't physically capable of doing them. But what I've been realizing in the past couple of weeks in particular, God's been really challenging me because he's like, you're not there anymore, Rita. Like you're really healthy now. Like you have a lot of energy, right? Your heart's disposition is completely changed from where it was at before. I had burnt out eight years ago because I really struggled a lot with self-reliance and I, I was acting a lot of con out of control and anxiety in my life and I wasn't acting out of freedom and that was really draining me. And that was taking a whole lot of, of of effort and energy out of my body and it, it made me really really weak and so he was kind of like he's like is it true really that you're not capable of doing this anymore he was really challenging that he's like is it true that this thing isn't good for you that you're not capable of it that it's not possible or is that an old mindset is that is that really something that that is true for you for the future and I was like whoa it's not I actually think I am capable of doing more than I have been. And so I've been just like testing it out just slowly, just taking little baby steps and, and seeing what it is I'm capable of. And so it's like this whole new adventure for me of just like, okay, well, where is my capacity? Where are my limits now? And, and I'm engaging in this, but, but I needed to have this enlightenment in this thinking process, in this judgment process that I had made in order to open up the possibility for me to choose these things for myself again. So I hope that this was helpful. I hope that you've had some insights and some aha moments. <laughs> uh, please let me know in the comments. You don't need to tell me what your aha moments was, but if you did have a moment of like, wow, yeah, this actually changes everything for me. I would love to hear about it in the comments. Just be like, yes, blew my mind. Thank you very much. Uh, it's just good feedback for me to know that these podcast episodes are in fact helpful for you. I, until then, my next episodes are going to be about our passions, our emotions. Okay. These ones are so practical. They're so helpful. I'm very excited to get into them. Um, this, this, these two are probably, I think the most important when it comes to our moral life is understanding our emotions because they are often what's impacting those judgments that I've been talking about. So a lot of the judgments we make, we actually make based off of our feelings. Um, and so becoming aware of them can be really helpful for us. And there's only 11 of them. So it's nice and simple. It's not overwhelming. And it's a really, it's a Catholic approach to emotion. So we'll get into that in our next episodes. Until then, God bless you. <laughs>